Okay, welcome everyone. So this today we are going to have a look at this uh, uh, two chapters, uh, 21 intensity estimation and 22 decay function. Uh, we are nearly to the end of the book. So we just uh, basically have uh, the last chapter within the next two weeks. So this is, uh, so as we have taken a bit of time uh, before this chapter, so we are now uh, getting a bit more inside this, um, uh, the argument that we see within this um, section, the spatial point patterns, okay? So we have a look at the intensity estimation, which means the, uh, um let's see um within the spatial uh, point processes uh, there is um um some the, the points can be like um uh, they, they they may have um uh let's say not the, the frequent sort of frequency uh, which is the uh, an high level of uh, um, grouping of points uh, in some location more than other. And so uh, we can estimate this intensity with a, um, an estimator, which is uh, lambda. So we talked about this lambda, which is a parameter, uh, uh, that we can uh, set based on some assumptions, okay? And so what we are going to do within this chapter is having a look at a bit more in details about this um, estimator. This lambda, okay, can, um, can be... Uh, identified uh, within uh, time or within a uh, certain um, location, okay? So you can imagine to have uh, um, this is your um, environment, okay? You have some points located uh, in, let, let's say, uh, in, in one location and other points in some other locations, okay? And um, you, then you might have those uh, that are called outliers. So just few points on other uh, sides. So within the, the, the spatial um, point patterns, so what we are going to um, identify is the uh, distribution, okay, of these points. Try to understand, to find an estimator or a parameter, then, then became an estimator, um, to uh, identify these uh, concentrations of points in some uh, particular location more than others. So we can um, say that this um, uh, intensity um, is um, mm, even in physics, okay? The intensity, um, it's uh, what's happened within a shorter, very short uh, um, time. But in this case, we consider instead of time, we consider the location. So we basically restrict this, this bit here, okay, as to be uh, as this distance within these points to be the smallest, okay? So we basically um, consider 
the the smallest region the small region containing the points and um, this is done with a mathematical formulation and when that you do you calculate uh, a limit which is the uh, in this case you have uh, uh, the estimated value uh, divided by um, this uh, dx which is the the smallest distance okay it's a bit uh, um, difficult if you don't haven't done uh, those things within uh, this type of mathematical formulations but you can then even have a look at oops um let's clear that up uh, you can even have a look at I think this is not uh, okay uh at a simplified version okay so this um intensity can even be seen uh, instead of looking at the limits at the estimated value of what's happened within a specified area okay so you set an area that it is for you the smallest area where you want to identify the concentration of points and then you basically divide the estimated value divided by this this area so you the result is uh, lambda and this lambda hat it's basically the estimator so the value that you have uh, uh, identified as this the most uh, probable uh, value um, now uh, rates of points within the area. Um, let's see if I can do this. Okay, so we are looking at this for non-stationary processes. So we had a look at what are the stationary processes. The non-stationary processes are those ones that are like such as random processes. Okay, so for random processes, we don't know what's where the the next points would be so because they are entirely random so what do we do is uh we do an estimation of the kernel okay and we, we do a kernel density estimation the kernel is uh something that might sound tricky uh, and uh, it's something that tricked me as well uh in the past but the kernel estimation is the uh like the, the universe of the possibilities that something can happen within a certain area, in this case that we are talking about spatial point patterns. So the kernel density estimation is basically the, the area where these things can happen. Those points can uh, be found or could be found. Okay, so instead of uh, um, basically, uh, looking at the intensity function, what we do is um, looking at the function of the intensity. Okay, and uh, this uh, this one this is a function that multiplies an area. So an integral is basically setting up. Uh, what's happened within an area, okay? So I still, I've got this uh, 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 situation with some points, oops. And uh, let's take up some bigger thing. So I have some concentrations of points in here. So what I want is basically identify this area, okay? This area can be even a window that we set, and we uh, what we do is basically multiply a function 
which is our uh, uh, even the uh, an estimation. And here is a uh, uh, is the function itself uh, the formulation. So this function multiplies the area where this the intensity uh, has been set as a certain value. Okay, so the integral is basically the area under a curve that covers our uh, point patterns estimations. Uh, and this is based on the intensity of these points within the area. Okay, so basically this is what's happened when you, uh, okay, you already have these functions, all is done, you have functions within our packages and everything, but behind the curtains, this is the reasoning behind the curtains, behind the functions that we then use. Okay, so uh, let's go forward and see that this function, for example, is, oops, and again, um, in this case, the function is uh, um, used, another parameter that we are going to see uh, later on, this k function, it's, it's another function that we are going to have a look at in the next chapter. And what does is uh, just a mathematical formulation to um, uh, identify the smaller pieces within an area, okay? So again, I have these conditions, I have some points that verify within a certain area, and then what I do is basically dividing my, this is uh, the X axis and these are the Y axis, okay? So oh, <laughs> what I do is basically breaking down this um, distance within smaller pieces and summing up, all the, um, imagine that I have a points here, a points there. So the distances that are within this air, these points, these other points, and these other points. Uh, and apply this mathematical formulation. Okay, so it's gonna be a bit, um, uh, so you imagine that you have this, points, uh, one point here, one point there, and one point there. And these are within this distance from the starting of the area. This is from this other distance, and this other one is from the other distance. What I do is basically breaking down these parts in the smallest pieces, and then consider the uh, the H, okay, uh, which is um, H is a smoothing parameter known as a band bit, uh, and this is um, basically the construction of a function that then is used to identify the intensity of points or the concentration of points in a certain area. Okay, so let's go back and clear everything up before uh, going forward. Uh, and this function itself uses another function, which is this k. And the k is a symmetric function. Uh, in mathematics, uh, it's used to specify if it's greater than zero and everything. So this is obviously need to be greater than zero. And um, the sum of all points uh, so the area is one. That means 
that it is a probability. Okay, it's a probability function. Okay, so what's happened that this kernel, which I already said, what is uh, you can now see uh, on a different view. Okay, so the kernel is what is uh, underneath this curve. And it's the, the universe of possibility, possibilities where points of our interest can, can uh, be found. Okay, and the bandwidth, uh, as you can see, is basically the maximum distance that we set, is such as a, a threshold that we set uh, from the center of mass to the edges. So our boundaries. And so what we do is basically one way is to, because when we estimate the kernel, this kernel is not exactly as it, as uh, what appears in the reality, okay? It's somehow distorted, okay? So what we do is basically provide an estimation of what it could be, okay? So uh, we should provide a correction of the edges. Uh, and we do this uh, with this other formulation, which is still an integral, so an area where uh, the probability of finding a point is of a certain level. Okay, so you can see that there are some uh, studies suggested here, for example, this one from Gartrell. Um, and uh, if you're interested, you can have a look at that. In terms of uh, getting into practice, okay, so there is a density function from this bad stats. And so we can see what's, what's gonna happen in here, okay? So if we load this bad stat, and uh, we know that this, mm, we mm, have uh, some uh, data, and this is one of the data, uh, this Japanese pie, you can see uh, that, that it is a planar point pattern made of 65 points. It is a window where we identify a, a rectangle, zero to one and zero to one, okay? One unit is 5.7 meters. If we have a quick look at the plot, we can see that this one uh, is the window that we set. Uh, and it's uh, 0, 1, and 0, 1. And inside there are some uh, Japanese pines. Okay, so these are the points. We are now um, considering some other uh, things, which is uh, now we we can use this density function from the uh, space that you see here is a, a kernel density estimation function. So the function that we just, that we actually see the formulation of uh, just um, before. And um, and so we can calculate um, the uh, lambda hat with just using the density of these planar points, okay? And uh, what is the output with the function? It's a real valid pixel image. Uh, within an enclosing uh, rectangle that we already seen. And then we can use this other function to calculate the variation, the sigma. Okay, so if we go back to the chapter, so we basically have used this lambda hat function 
the density. And so we can see that if we plot this lambda hat, where is it? Uh, the first plot, okay, is this one here. And so what, what shows us is the intensity of the points in some in some location more than others. If we go back to the original uh, point patterns, we can clearly see that, I don't know if I can do that in here. Yes, we can clearly see that this location shows a concentration of points more than other location. Just give you an, an example, okay? In fact, if I go back in here, I can see that this part is clearly the highest values of intensity and so the concentration of points. Okay. Let's oops, let's have a look if we use a, a different value of sigma. In this case, the, the first point, the plots that we see, so this one here uses this uh, 0 0.125 uh, uh, as a sigma, okay? What's happened if we change the sigma? We know that sigma is the variation, oh, okay? So we can see that here we have this some uh, um, estimation of the bandwidth, okay? And... Um, what we are now uh, estimating is the, uh, let's remind ourselves, what is the sigma that we specify in here with the app function? I haven't done it. So the app function, because this is uh, the attribute function so you can see that this is uh can be from the base uh, let's say this is uh we basically grab the attribute of the output of the uh density function and we specify that we want the sigma which one which uh, attribute we want and um so we cannot see it here, but uh, it's good to know that if you use the attribute function specifying sigma, you can extrapolate the value of sigma. So what we do now is basically changing the sigma to 0.05. We can see that things change a lot. Okay. So um, you can see uh, you can even see from the book, which is uh, clear, that this is the default bandwidth. And here we specify a different value. Okay, so basically, as the bandwidth was uh, no point 0.12, okay, about 13, 12. Now we are reducing it to no point no five no five and see the difference. If we put it to a larger value, things change dramatically. And so we can even say that we can estimate that on a larger uh, bandwidth, the concentration of points will move, will move on a side rather than centering the window. Okay, so, and we have this uh, other view. Okay, so this is a uh, quite interesting uh, estimation. So uh, you basically change the value of sigma uh, and have a different overview of the um, pressure for patterns density uh, mm, 
of, of this uh, uh, Japanese pines. Okay, so uh, now we might want to even have a look at the radio, okay, of the intensity. And this is so when you compare uh, um, other fields. So this is a nice, uh, another interesting um, example that we can use. Can have a look. And we use this spar package, which I'm not sure to have it uh, um, installed. So just a minute. Okay. So package and use this spar. So install the package, then load the package. And uh, it's showed me that I cannot use it because I do not have uh, actually, but it doesn't matter. So basically now I'm not going to install these things, but uh, this data showed us uh, that we can, uh, uh, this package within this data um, basically contains uh, 761 cases of uh, primarily, primary biliary cirrhosis, PBC, along with 3,000, about 3,000 controls, which represent uh, at-risk population in the northeastern of England, and they are collected from the 87 to the 94. And so we have this data within this figure in here. So we can see that the cases are uh, concentrated in this area uh, and the controls are more sparse because there are more controls, but still concentrated in the same area. So um, going back to there, you can use this unmark function and specify specifying the cases. We know that what is what means the mark and the unmark because we mentioned it previously, previous chapters. And so then uh, uh, we have seen the image plot the cases that you have unmarked. Okay, and those are here. And as well, plot the controls. Okay. Uh, and so, basically, in this case, we assume that this point patterns is a realization of a Poisson process. Obviously, we always consider a Poisson process for, for uh, if we want to simulate a, a similar patterns uh, within synthetic data, for example, we can use a Poisson process because the Poisson process in itself, uh, what does is basically, uh, it's, it's again uh, a function that is built up on the concept that uh, points can appear um, isolated some, somewhere and somehow with some probabilities. And uh, it, it's a, a the Poisson process is the process that is usually used for simulating uh, diseases, spread of diseases, because um, um, it, it consider uh, this lambda parameter, which is the intensity of appearing infections or. or um, based on some assumption that we have just seen uh, uh, previously. But now what we are going to do is basically consider the, re the ratio, the ratio um, of this intensity based on uh, a certain value of la uh, alpha. And this alpha is basically the ratio of number of cases on the number of controls. So you basically can um, 
uh, uh, identify an intensity ratio that would be uh, then used uh, to um, uh, within the density function itself. So um, this is the formula, which is rho and, and the estimation. This um, this rho x represents the spatial variation of in relative risk. Uh, why alpha is a factor. Um, and it is actually the um, the ratio of the cases on the uh, on the controls. In this case, that we are considering this case study, but in itself, it's a factor. It's a it's an adjustment factor uh, that you apply on your first level intensity estimator alpha half and in fact this is alpha zero okay then you apply an, an adjustment based on uh, uh, on the uh, which is this value of alpha uh, and you uh, can then uh, build up a new uh, estimator which is the intensity ratio Okay, so we, it, it is this uh, row hat. Okay, um, and so this uh, um, density, this is our alpha hat, uh, um, calculated as we calculated before. Okay. Uh, cases, uh, uh, the number of cases, the number of controls, and this is our alpha hat, okay, which is this one here. Um, and then within the density, we specify a sigma, which is based on this uh, uh, beforehand, so this alpha zero, okay? So we have this uh, base intensity. So we calculate the density of cases. The density of control, extrapolate the sigma and consider, uh, construct the bandwidth and use this uh, as a new sigma. Uh, then calculate the alpha hat and put it inside the formula. There it is. This is uh, the formula. This this T is the transpose function. Uh, and this is done to, to do this type of multiplication and ratio. And so the images clearly shows the concentration of points for cases and the concentration of process for controls. And this is the output and we can see <laughs> it's clear that the maximum uh, intensity ratio is within this area and it, it, it is clearly because both cases and controls are within this area. But this plot is nice, isn't it? Shows with different colors the highest level of uh, concentration. And we can use this uh, image.plot function from the fields library. This fields, uh, it's a nice package. So you can have a look at that. I don't know if you have any addition uh, things uh, that I missed somehow. Uh, it's a nice, uh, you know, flow of uh, information. I really like it. Yes. Um, you mentioned about intensity. Also, It's also possible to use it in a temporal framework. So then it would mean for time that you are talking about the density over time. So the number of events 
for a specific time unit, right? Yeah, in this case, it, 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 it's used to identify within an area. Mm -hmm. But obviously, that can be, so you have uh, some cases and you, uh, in this case, it's specified within this chapter, it's specified that the uh, data is within a certain time frame. So they are not looking what's happened within time. They set a time frame. Yeah. And they have some data within a time frame. But obviously, you can use this the intensity, uh, looking at the intensity changes within time. And then at that point, you consider the location as is. So you, you set, uh, you, you do not think how points move within the area on a specified time frame, but you uh, consider the point uh, changing within time. Okay. So instead of X, so you have T, uh, and so you, you might, you have a different, uh, uh, so instead of X, you have T, and you see that this point, how this this concentration of point change in time, and you but you do not have the area in that case. Okay. Okay. So I would like to um, give a, a comment. First of all, nice to meet you uh, both. This is my first time in the in this back club, but it. As it is a topic that uh, directly interests me because I'm working with many of the uh, of the things I decide to to join today. Uh, so basically, I'm a neuroscientist, and what I do is to map the position of cells in the brain. So I make microscopy, I align these images to the available atlas. And I map different cells, neurons, astrocytes, microglia, and I have point patterns of cells in my brains. That's a really nice thing to do and something we, I believe we need to advance in neuroscience. But I have a, a strong limitation, especially using the SPAD stat package. And is that all the literature I have read about uh, the intensity estimation, et cetera, et cetera. There are dozens of books and in all the books, you know, you have examples of one image, you know, okay, let's calculate intensity in, of, uh, I don't know, crimes in New York City. So you have one image, one map, and you do all the things there. In my case, I have dozens of animals per group. This group belongs to certain time points. So it's like a hierarchical, thing when you have many, many groups, two or three orders in groups, you know, and my limitation is basically how to compare all these things, no? Because the thing I do is, okay, I can, I calculate the, the intensity per animal, the mean intensity per animal, then I calculate, so I take these means and I calculate the intensity per group, then per time point, whatever, you know, but I'm completely missing, of course, the uncertainty uh, in the intensity estimation itself, because I'm, I get the uncertainty in between means, but I don't get the uncertainty of each animal. For example, of course, this intensity estimation comes with a lot of, with a measurable uncertainty in the, in the process, but I'm missing completely that. So, so I'm losing a lot of information from my angle. So my question is basically, if some of you perhaps have some experience or perhaps some resources available online to, to face this limitation of, okay, how do I do intensity of estim estimation for cases where my point patterns are embedded within groups in several layers. So that's basically my, <laughs> my problem. I'm trying to advance this stuff uh, using the new uh, AI tools, but still I think this is very challenging to, yeah. 
Tun du das? Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's the uh, florist, maybe has a bit more experience than. <laughs> um, well, I'm new to point patterns. Okay. You see, so for me, this is all very interesting, but new. Okay. But still, I I think I do understand more or less uh, the problem. Oh. And well, um, I think if you consider each intensity estimation as one, yeah, like some sort of observation. So yeah. it could be mm -hmm. an overall intensity or perhaps the intensity image. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At least when it's a number, so the overall intensity, you could, then you have a data set with hierarchical groups mm -hmm. of observations, which you could analyze with, for example, generalized linear mixed models or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would, I think, make sense to, to then okay. um, look at the effect of the different uh, grouping factors. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing. And perhaps another, if, if, Time is also a component. Yeah. Uh, um, then maybe the intensity ratio, which is in this chapter, might yeah. be of help because then you could consider the first point in time as yeah. a reference and then calculate the ratios relative to that first um, point in time yeah. as a response variable, for example, and then consider uh, the change over time, perhaps, uh, and then, yeah, that could be one other, um, yeah, covariate in the model. So time then would be a covariate. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah cool. I, would say, I would also say that you can group, uh, well, first thing I thought is principal component analysis. I don't know okay. if you no. can group uh dimensional things and then once it's grouped then you can apply a model mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of practice and say mm -hmm. how do i do you can do it just an average of mm -hmm. the various groups and mm -hmm. then compare them mm -hmm. again there are for uh, um animals distribution patterns mm -hmm. for example let's say mm -hmm. Uh, frogs or things or you know flies and everything that, that that those are very challenging to identify because they do not they move for senses uh, so they follow smell things sounds and things you you don't you don't even know so they are they are random you know and they use uh, an envelope yeah uh, okay. uh -huh. type of model yeah. There are some, uh, so basically, you can, uh, what you can do is, or calculate different models, you set a view on a point in time, different point in time, and calculate a model, or, and then apply the result to a new model within time. <laughs> and there is a, uh, I suggest you to have a look at the species distribution models. Uh, that there are lots of interesting packages. Uh, how is it called, the last you mentioned? Uh, the envelope type of envelope yeah, model. Yeah, after that, the, to have a look at which kind of distribution models. You, can ah, you said envelope again? Ah, perhaps I misunderstood. Okay. Uh, species, yeah. species distribution. Ah, models. species distribution models. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, because there's many people in ecology doing point pattern stuff. No, <laughs> yeah. most of the resources are from from ecology. I have seen. Yeah. Interesting. The the um, you know just uh, something to for example, uh, movement of frogs. Because no. if you think about yeah. frogs. Uh -huh. You know, why they move on a certain area more than another, they mm -hmm. are female, male, more, more, in, and um, this is can, if you can 
identify or somehow you cannot identify clearly so i mean you cannot predict correctly what's gonna happen next mm -hmm. okay but uh if you think about a case a cases and think uh, uh within a certain season they can be more in one location than another and so you identify some points to start mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and then you add uh those are called covariates okay so mm -hmm. elements within the model that are k because at the end of the story what's happened when you apply a function um uh, it's always mathematics you you they use a bunch of numbers okay the function look at the numbers and see what is uh, in common within these numbers? If they mm -hmm. have similar mean, similar standard deviation, uh, if they appear within other elements such as time or environments, uh, environmental uh, variables such as uh, you know temperature or number of uh, things within your study. You think about a person that as an activity, does a, a physical activity, does not eat something or not. So all elements that can be key to can be key, key to identify a possible outcome. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you have different strators, you can maybe calculate a model for each one and then another model with the result. Cool. Cool. Okay, that's clear for me. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not, you know, <laughs> that that um, you know, cal probability calculus. So you can grab it right, but mm. it's not. Uh, there is always a margin of error. Yeah. An intrinsic error, yeah. which cannot be adjusted. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, no, I'm I'm uh, by by mentality a Bayesian, so I love errors and I love uncertainty. <laughs> so, cool. Cool, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I hope I helped uh, somehow. Um, so the next chapter is this k function, which already we, we already seen this k function, okay, within the previous uh, formula. And now what's uh, going to happen within this chapter is just digging a bit more within the details of, because it's easy to say you use a function, but what function I can use? And so the function is built on some, uh, again, assumptions. Uh, and um, in this case, it's a uh, Poisson process and even a the identification of a process within this the point pattern distribution within time within uh, an area it's very important so you you might want to to do uh, uh, a, a, a visualization of your data and see if they within the density because the density is basically the concentration of points uh, if if shape a, a certain type of curve. So if the curve is a bell shaped or tend to be skewed on the right, skewed on the left, if, uh, looking at the, the shape of the distribution helps help you understand, uh, identify a right, uh, the mostly correct type of process. Okay, so in this case, a Poisson process is the one that better identify points that appears um, around. Okay, so this K can be estimated as a P S um, power of two, where uh, S is the distance. So we know that this is um, this K function so the mention earlier um because this is uh the same as this one here let's go back 
where we saw the decay function it's this one this function here okay which is this one here and so uh this specification where is it again shows you that the estimated number of further events within distance s is uh, divided by lambda. So we go back. So it is the estimated value divided by lambda. Okay. Uh, and this means that the result of this uh, uh, estimation is again can be summarized as a p. Uh, square of s. It's basically what's what what's happened here that you make some reasoning and say, okay, uh, my uh, range of um, uh, possibilities is uh, given uh, based on a certain intensity of these points, but then you need an adjustment. And this adjustment, you can consider uh, the square, um, the, um, the the distance, the maximum distance, and with um, this um, uh, p value. Um, and this is because you are basically as you can see, is the um, formula for um, the circle, the area of the circle. So you're basically starting from a little um, band, uh, from your basic bandwidth, and then you eventually consider what it would be all around, what is going to happen all around that that um, you use that as a rate um, radius and um, uh, calculate the area of the circle. And so this is a um, uh, decay function. Uh, and again, um, as you can see, this is a just a transformation of the previous formula where the estimation is given by lambda times k and and so this is the circle the the, the line um, from the center of mass uh, and the the border is basically your bandwidth and you then uh, consider the entire area to uh, catch some point within the area and then consider that as a um, representation of what is going to happen within the other uh, locations around that area. Basically, you it's like sampling um, a bit of uh, um, a smaller area, uh, and then consider that what's happened within this area, it will happen around with the same pattern. Okay, obviously it is an estimation, but uh, um, you can consider that as well. Um, and so this uh, is um, the, the age correction. And um, you can, uh, this is all, uh, this is the first formula that we saw up here. So lambda to the minus one times the estimation, and it is this one here, lambda to the minus one for the estimation. Uh, and so you can do this in R using the cast function. Okay. And so here is a um, uh, representation of some special points, and then you use this cast function on the special points and um, 
when you plot it, you see that it provides you um, a, a curve which estimates the possible um, best uh, result of the k function that you can use uh, within uh, testing spatial randomness. And so uh, here is an envelope example uh, of the spatial points and the uh, result of the cast function, the application of the cast function. And so you can see that now you have a larger bandwidth of what is going to happen, can, can happen. Uh, obviously, you, so there is much more to see, but uh, it's a point to start. Assumption. Great, thank you. Federica. I don't have specific questions about this. I found it interesting to see how it can be shown as a function of the distance. So the K function, that was uh, very interesting because then you can test for uh, regular clusters um, as a function of the distance, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation and a pleasure to meet you both. Yeah. Okay. So I'll end the recording.